Sir David Amos was a well-liked and long-serving constituency MP, but his near 40 years of public service were ended by a man claiming to be an act in his own under the ideology of the Islamic State's group. Today, 26-year-old Ali Harbi Ali was found guilty of the parliamentarian's murder and preparing a terrorist act. The jury returned this verdict in no less than 18 minutes. That is how overwhelming the evidence was. Ali Harbi Ali may have pleaded not guilty, but he never contested that he did the act. Even when making his defence, he conceded his guilt. He told the court that he killed Sir David Amos in the name of Muslims and for the sake of Allah. When asked if he felt any regret or shame, he told the court that he did not. Is this a terrorist attack? I mean, I guess, yeah, I killed an MP and I done it. Yeah. Okay. After arrest, Ali consistently claimed responsibility and denied remorse. This is the emergency call made on October 15th by a constituent and eyewitness. The audio is distressing. Please, please, quick now. The man is wielding a knife. Um, he's yeah. telling me he's, Where are he's, you? Killed, he's killed David Amos at Belfast Methodist Church. Can you see how big the knife is? It's a carving knife, a big kitchen carving knife. How big, roughly? It's, it's in his hand. How big would you say that knife is? 12 inches. That knife entered the parliamentarian's chest cavity four times and proved fatal. After that brutal murder of a serving parliamentarian, Ali Harbi Ali phoned his sister for over 10 minutes. That phone call came to an end once the police apprehended him. He had hoped to die. Can you show us, mate? Stay back, yeah? This is when officers arrived at the church Sir David held his last surgery. Mate, drop the knife! Drop the Right, search him. Right, mate, at the moment you're under arrest for murder. All right, if you like to say anything, they may on your defence. If you do not mention when mention something which you like with Arnie Cole, anything you do say may be given as evidence. You understand me? But in custody, Ali volunteered his guilt when asked about his motivation to murder. Domestic or hate related in Terror. Terror. I'd say hate, yeah. What basis? Racial, religious? Religious, Before his attack, Ali was already known to the authorities. In 2014, he was referred to the anti-extremism programme Prevent and interviewed by officials. The once studious pupil had become distracted by the war in Syria and wanted to join the Islamic State group. When unable to travel, he turned his focus to here. This was Ali scoping out Parliament. His main target was Cabinet Minister Michael Gove and other MPs who voted for airstrikes. This is what Ali told the police. I'll be honest with you, there's been a lot of times where I've gone out in my head with a plan to do something and then I would come back on. Hmm. So, you know, because, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I bottled it, you know? That's the word, football word. But Ali did settle on Sir David as an easier target, whose surgery was available. On October 15th, Ali travelled from his home in London to Leon C in Essex. He made a booking under the guise that he was a constituent. Well, from our investigation, which has looked into Ali Harvey Ali in a very thorough and deep way, we can say that he was a self-initiated terrorist who acted alone, did not share his plans with anyone else, uh, and conducted all of his activity alone. The authorities say radicalisation is evolving and they're fighting multiple frontiers. Joe Cox was murdered five years prior to Sir David Amos by a far-right extremist. But today was Ali Harbi Ali's day in court. He wanted to die a martyr, but instead he lived to face justice. Now convicted, Ali will be sentenced this Wednesday. Simeon Brown there. Well, earlier I spoke to Kem Leadbeater, the Labour MP for Batley and Spen. The seat was held by her sister Joe Cox until her murder by a far-right extremist in 2016. I began by asking what her thoughts were as today's verdict came through. My thoughts today are really with Sir David Amos's family and friends and his constituents and all the people that were affected by his horrific murder. I hope for them that today will provide a sense of relief, hopefully a sense of being able to move on with the next chapter of their lives. 
you don't really ever get closure when something like this happens. You know, I know that more than anybody, but I just hope that they can find a way forward after the verdict. Exactly as you say, you never quite get closure, particularly as a family, I'm assuming. But does getting some justice ease any of the pain at all? Do you know what? I'm not really sure that it does. You know, when you have a loved one murdered, there's never a sense of moving on, certainly not in my experience. Um, for me, it's about just clinging on to your very precious, very happy memories. And, and Sir David's family, I'm sure, have got lots of those. And I think his constituents have got lots of those. He 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 seemed like a very good, loving um, constituents MP who people thought a great deal of. And he was famous, of course, for being a very open MP. He loved being a constituency MP. But his murder, the horrific murder of your sister, raised huge questions about the nature of politics and the safety of MPs. Do you think we have the balance right now? I mean, I think Sir David's murder would suggest otherwise, wouldn't it? And I think you're right. I think there's two big parts of this for me. The first is what can be done to get the balance right in terms of protecting democracy? But how can we protect that democracy and that freedom, but also make sure that the people who put themselves forward for public life feel safe and secure in their work, and not just the, the members themselves, but also their staff. Um, and that is a really tricky balance. Now, I'm really pleased that lots of work is going on behind the scenes, certainly with the parliamentary authorities and with the police, to improve things as best we can. But ultimately, lots of people, including myself, go into politics because we want to make a difference. And part of making that difference is to be accessible and to be available to the people that you're trying your best to represent. So that's a real challenge. I think the other really important side of this is the culture around politics and sadly the toxicity and the abuse and intimidation that elected people face on a daily basis. Because you talk because such people... a lot about that, sorry to interrupt you, but you talk such a lot about that in the early days after the death of your sister, but are you saying essentially not enough has changed in terms of the nature of de debate in British politics? Sadly, I'm not sure things are any better in terms of the culture around politics. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, it's clearly, social media is a factor, but this isn't just an online problem. It's an offline problem as well. And what worries me is the fact that a lot of this has become normalised. You know, we've now seen the horrific murder of two MPs you know, people must be fearful that this potentially could happen again. Do you think it damages politics and it, and it stops people from coming into that world? I think that's a real worry. Uh, you know, I, I often say, if I was 10 years younger, 20 years younger, would I have wanted to put myself forward for, for politics? And I really don't think I would. It's a, it's a difficult place to be. And it worries me that we will lose good people from public life. And certainly in the 2019 election, we had a number of MPs citing abuse and intimidation as one of the reasons why they stepped away. And I also worry that we're not going to get good, young, positive people coming forward for politics because it is a difficult and dangerous place to be. Kim Ledbeater, thank you very much for talking to us this evening.